Well, we'd like you to turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We've been working our way through this chapter. Um, some very interesting things, maybe some things you've never heard about before. Uh, some people might have never heard of the rapture, right? Uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church. The glorious appearing of Jesus where uh, the Jesus brings with him all of our loved ones of faith who died in him, brings their spirits with him, and he resurrects their bodies from the grave. And those who are alive when Jesus comes will be caught up, will be raptured, caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds, with our loved ones. We'll join him together in heaven. And then the Bible begins to tell us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, some of the things that take place after Christ comes for his church. We want to read about that as we look at uh, chapter 2. Let's stand as we read God's word this morning. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed at this time. For the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawlessness is by the activity of Satan with all power, false signs, and wonders, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth so to be saved. Therefore, God sends on them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Thank you. you may be seated. Most of us can all say the longer that we have lived our lives that we can recognize significant changes that have occurred in our culture. Changes just happening all the time. When my grandmother was 109 years old, people would often come up to me and say, man, that's old. She's seen a lot of things change in her lifetime. And when you think being born in night uh, 1899 which she was and living all the way into 2000 and something uh, do the math 109 years later uh, you know 2008 that's that's actually 2010 I think it was yeah um, that's that's quite a significant quite a significant lifespan to change but you know you don't have to be a hundred and nine to realize that as time marches on, right, things change. Some of the changes we experience are great. They're beneficial, while other changes are not. Some changes that we experience in life are unstoppable, like aging, right? <laughs> we see there's a whole market of people trying to sort of arrest or slow up the aging process by all the things you can buy. Uh, some changes can be resisted. Right? 
some changes that happen in society and culture, we can, we can stand up and resist. We can all sort of get excited about the changes that have improved the quality of life. I mean, all of us really enjoy that we have central heat and air conditioning, right, at this moment, that we're not sitting out having this service in a tent somewhere with a big bonfire, right? Uh, that would be awful cool. Um, most of us could say um, the change that uh, brought us indoor plumbing is pretty good, right? Can you imagine going to the outhouse today, right? Be a, a very cold, quick experience, I'm sure. And I, I don't know, I like the change that brought, you know, uh, refrigerators that dispense ice and water, right? Those pretty cool things. And I know our younger generation is pretty hip with the changes that have happened in technology and social media, right? There's this whole thing with instant chatting and tweeting and Instagram and Vines, and I don't even know what it all is. I, I was, I'm over 50, so I, you know, I'm... I'm pretty, pretty lame to that stuff, um, but it, it's pretty cool. The thing I like about uh, technology is, is um, I don't have to use a rotary dial phone anymore. That's pretty cool. And I don't have to have a cord that I ha keeps me in one place. I can walk around when I make my phone calls. That's, that's great. I love those kinds of advancements. Now, um, so regardless of what our age is in this room, we've all witnessed a fair amount of changes. Um, my television antenna that I installed on my roof gets this station out of Sioux City called Decades, right? And on Decades, they show all of the old television shows. Last night, it was Hill Street Blues. And, you know, I was just waiting for the line when the sergeant uh, gets done with the squad meeting, right? And they all get up, and he says, remember, oh, 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 be careful out there. Remember, he always used to say that. And... You know, all of these shows kind of indicate how, as you look back at shows that took place in the 70s and 80s, how life has changed, how vehicles have changed, how many things have been transformed and occurred over the years. And there is one dimension, though, of life where a good measure of change has occurred and taken place in our society that I would have to identify and say is not all that good. And the nature of the changes in this dimension of life sadly seem to be very welcomed and even ingrained in the minds of many people in our society and culture. And the changes that I'm referring to um, are the changes that have really occurred in the spiritual realm of life. There's been a lot of change that's taken place in the religious sector of our society. How over a span of 40 to 50 years, churches have changed their thoughts, their thinking about what uh, their beliefs are, about what Scripture teaches. Now, get this, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not agreeing that I like these changes because we have a God who said that he is forever unchanging, right? He said, heaven and earth, Jesus said, heaven and earth will, will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In other words, what Jesus was communicating about the words of God that he's delivered to us in his words is that they are good for all time. They're not culturally bound, right? They're not for one culture. That It's not up to one culture to say, you know, that was stuff written back then. It doesn't apply to us today. Because God is great enough and powerful enough to create um, a, an instruction that is applicable to every generation. But sadly, what I've seen over my lifespan is how religious communities have taken something that is eternal and flawless and from the voice and the mouth of God to inspire writers to write it down for every generation have come to say, well, we just don't know if we want to accept this anymore. And there's been a change created. Change in the spiritual 
realm of life, spiritual realm that affects the values, the morality of how people live their lives. In our time, we have witnessed the emergence of political correctness. You can't really say anything uh, that might offend somebody's beliefs, right? And or disagree with someone's beliefs. Especially if these beliefs are being promoted in society by the media culture. Uh, you, 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 you have to be careful. We've seen that. We've seen moral relativity sort of emerge in our day, which, which means truth is not absolute. It's something you make up for yourself. You make up your own rules. You make up your own morality. You make up whatever, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's the Nike thing. If it feels good, do it. You know, it's like, um, it's like the Burger King philosophy of life. Have it your way, right? That's moral relativism. If you want to steal something and have a good reason for it, you steal it. Because all truth is relative to your situation. It's not absolute. We've seen that change, that feeling, that understanding. Uh, we've seen abortion, killing of innocent life. We've seen cohabitation, right? Experimental, living together prior to a marriage commitment. We've seen homosexuality. We've seen religious pluralism. What is that? That is, it doesn't matter what you believe. You know, what the Muslims believe, what the, what the you know, Hindus believe. Everybody's God. It's all the same God. It, all roads lead to the same place. No religion, no belief system can claim exclusivity. Even though Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's not saying there are other ways, is he? He's not, he's not saying that there's a pluralistic plan that the God of this universe, because he is God in human flesh, he's not saying that um, someday it's going to be okay when Muhammad shows up and when Hindus and all these other things uh, come onto the scene or are already present in the culture, that, that, that they're gonna, their idea of God's going to be equally as valid as what I'm telling you, revealing God in human flesh to you. No, Jesus isn't saying that. Jesus is saying he's very exclusive. He's saying there's only one way to heaven. But you look in society how that's changed. And you get in discussion. Well, you know, uh, parents say, yeah, I don't really care what church my kids go to just so they go to church. Hmm. Really? Well, you know all roads lead to heaven. You know, everybody gets there this, you know, some way, you know. And so their path and your path and, you know, we're, we're just not going to politically, we're, we're just not going to offend anybody by saying, wait a second, that isn't right. That isn't correct. There's an absolute standard that says uh, that that isn't the way. We've seen that change in our society in our day. We've certainly seen a departure in our day of recognizing the authority of Scripture, the authority of God's Word. I can remember back in the 70s, my dad had a debate with his denomination over whether the, the denomination would put in its doctrinal statement that they believe that God's word is inerrant, infallible, and inspired. Uh, he never thought that he'd ever have to fight that battle. And how a denomination was considered, well, that's just a little bit too offensive. That's just a little bit too strong, you know. We want to be all inclusive, right? We don't want to offend anybody. We don't. We we want to try to right open our arms to as many people as we can. So we so we gotta take away anything that might seem a little bit offensive to people with the strong language, right? And so we we've seen in our day how the train I call it of moral depravity has left the station. It left the station a few years ago, and it's gaining steam. And, and I ask the question today, where is, that, where is that headed? Where is the society and culture headed? Right? With the way things are going, with the, with the landmark decisions of Supreme Court and all these things that have taken place back in 73, you do know this is the Sanctity of Life Sunday, do you not? This is the Sunday that, that Christians and those who believe that that the children conceived in the womb are, are a precious gift of God to parents and, and that life, all life is sank, sacred and, 
and, and valuable to God, created in His image. Today is the day when we, we remember because of the Roe versus Wade decision that took place in 1973 that, that struck down this concept, this idea of life being valued. And now it's just fetal tissue that can be harvested and, and destroyed and, and brutalized. If you ever saw the pictures of what Planned Parenthood is sort of didn't want anybody else to see about how casual they are about destroying life. And I ask the question, do you think, do you think we will ever, ever see a day when people realize the sexual revolution advertised, glamorized, and glorified by Hollywood and made its way into our culture and even into religious circles will see a course correction? Do you ever see that? Will you ever see a day in your life when remaining sexually pure until your marriage is the norm? Will you ever see the day when the sanctity of life conceived in the womb is honored? Will you ever see a day again when true marriage is between one man and one woman? That's the standard. Will you ever see a day again when it's acknowledged that the Bible is the sole authority and the standard that religious institutions hold on to as authoritative in our world. Do you think that day will ever come again? Has that been lost forever? And sometimes it's it's okay to sit and think for a minute because we get busy in life to ask yourself, where is it all headed? Where is this world going? at its pace, at its rate, with the decisions and the things that have changed morally over time. Where are these changes leading us? Now, I want to tell you something. The world itself, the world system that the Bible says is under Satan's control and power, right? Satan's dominion. That world system really has not changed. In its, in its regard to morality and selfishness, right? Right? That world is always believed whatever you want to do is okay, whatever, whatever gratifies yourself. There's no moral restraints that anybody's obligated because in that world, God really doesn't exist. There is no God. There is no law. There is no moral principles to guide your life, right? So in the world system, that really hasn't changed. But you know what really has changed? Much as what has changed is the church's response to how the world Uh, what is going on in the world. That's what's changed. The church's response to it. What really has changed, I believe, is the world is having a greater impact over the church in regards to change rather than the church impacting the world for spiritual change. That's really what's happening in our day. You're finding less and less churches that are willing to stand up for what the truth of God word, God's word teaches in its entirety. Less and less churches that are willing to do that. You see, the church, as some of our older saints in this church could tell you in days gone past, used to have a very significant impact on the values and the morals of our society. It, it really did. It restrained it. It held it back. It had influence over the way people viewed morality and marriage and all these kinds of things. Life. Because the values of our society at one time reflected the teachings of the Bible in regard to the sanctity of life, in the re- regards to marriage, in the, the regards to morality and personal integrity. But this has changed. We're moving in a different direction. But it's a direction that the Bible tells us that we shouldn't be surprised about. Because the Bible tells us it would surface in the last days. These kinds of changes are synonymous with the changes the Bible says will take place in the last days prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So, I'm going to say it, apart from a major spiritual awakening, which I would love to see, wouldn't you? I would love to see a major spiritual awakening. I'd like to see things go back. I'd like to see a change in the attitude about some of these issues that have just sort of been thrown out the window, right? Apart from a major spiritual awakening, we are headed for the apostasy that Paul tells us about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul said, the apostasy must come first. The apostasy will usher in the day of the Lord, the day of God's great judgment on sin and dealing with uh, and saving Israel. That seven-year tribulation period that's been identified as the day of the Lord in Scripture. What will usher that in? What will the climate of times be prior to this day of the Lord dawning on society? I believe it will be sort of ushered in by a climate of apostasy. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, right? Because the Thessalonians have been deceived, right? And people have come, and they're all shook up, right? They're, they're alarmed. They're disturbed because someone came, said, Hey, you know, uh, Paul said this. You missed, the, you missed the rapture. We're already in the day of the Lord. He, you know, and they're all shook up that somehow the teaching that Paul, they received once from Paul has, has somehow missed them, and, and they're all shook up. And Paul says, um, Don't let anybody deceive you in any way. For, the, for that day, the day of the Lord will not come unless... The rebellion comes first, right? The rebellion. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. Notice, he says the rebellion must come first. Now, I want to ask you something. When you hear that word rebellion, what images come to your mind? Rebellion. What thoughts? When you see rebels or rebellion, well, you know what that means. That's a defiance against authority, right? Somebody's in authority, someone rebels. Somebody's in charge, I don't like that they're in charge, I'm going to rebel. I'm going to do my own thing, right? That's, that's the rebellion, a departure from traditional values, a freedom to do as one pleases. No moral restraint, no this or that, no rules, no, no principles, no guiding principles of life. You know, I'm rebelling, I'm my own person. You've heard of, uh, there are anarchists. In society, right? They wear little little hats and stuff with a big A on it. It has a big circle around it. Anarchists, right? There's even a show on TV called The Sons of What? Anarchy. What is that about? You know what anarchy is? That is a rebellion against authority, right? All authority is bad. And we're starting to see some of the, some of the, the, the fallout of this on our major streets and cities with police officers and confrontations and struggles and all kinds of, you know, things going on, right? We need to, play, we need to pray for our, for our officers, those who serve us, right? There's anarchy going on. It's not inhibited or restrained by moral principle. It's rising it up against clearly stated moral and ethical values. Right? So prior to the appointed time when Jesus comes to gather his bride together, the church, prior to the rapture of the church, there's going to be a growing vein of dissent, of spiritual apathy, of carnal worldliness, of rebellion that will surface in society, preparing the lost and the religious unsaved for the coming of the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness, the man of sin. There's going to be a climate that is very present in society that will serve to put onto the world scene, to accept this very deceptive pawn of Satan who will come in and grab the attention of the world community. We're going to talk about that in coming weeks. Now notice Paul says in verse 5, Paul reminded the fellow believers that how they've discussed this already. So it's important for you to know 
Jesus mentioned this rebellion. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 through 13. Matthew 24, 10 through 13. Here Jesus is talking about this rebellious climate. Notice what he says. Matthew 24, 10 through, 13, 10 through 13. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. When a climate of lawlessness begins to grow in a society, People's hearts become hardened towards love, towards sacrifice, towards service. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, history records that before Jesus Christ's first coming, there was a period of apostasy that took place in Israel. There was an evil ruler by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes. He ruled from 175 to 164 BC, right? Antiochus Epiphanes' goal was to wipe out the religion of Israel. Now, why is this important? Israel was the only religious system that believed that there was a God, a triune or God in heaven who had directly spoken to them. All the other gods in this world that people worship, they just made up. Israel had direct intervention, direct conversation, direct relationship with their God. And so this guy tried to, tried to eliminate that, but he, he wasn't successful. People rose up against him. But what Paul is saying here, just like the first coming of Christ was ushered in, preceded by a period of apostasy, the second coming of Christ will not occur until something, some kind of similar apostasy has taken place. This apostasy or spiritual rebellion will begin in preparation for the emergence of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, in order for people to worship him as God, right? Because that's what he's going to do. He's going to throw his image in the temple in Jerusalem, and that temple is not built yet, right? It will be. He's going to put his image in that temple and he's going to gain consensus from Israel and from the nations of the world that he can be trusted. He's a peacemaker. He can make things happen that 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 none of the presidents have been ever able to do with Jews and Palestinians. And he's going to bring a, a pseudo false peace to the world. He's going to convince people that he has this power and he's going to convince them with signs and wonders and miracles that he'll be able to perform that will wow people in their worship of their religions. And notice the text says so-called gods, right? He's going to bring them together. He's going to dupe them until that day when the abomination of desolation comes and he puts his image in the temple and he says, all right, folks, the, the game has changed. I'm God. You need to worship me. And you're going, wait a second. If some wacko did that today, people would say, he's a wacko, right? He's a wacko. But if times got so tough for people, so difficult in living on this earth, because I can see it already, people are really getting tired of war. They're getting tired of terrorism. They're getting tired of having to live in fear every day on their streets about something going to break out. And if someone can come and offer you peace, do you think people wouldn't want to listen to that person? Right? If that person can get the community of the world together, right, which is much more easier with technology today, do you not think People might be prepared for that, especially after all the wars, all of the violence, all of the destruction. I think so. We all know how fickle our economy is, right? The stock market's gone where? Right? We all know 
how it's up and it's down. We know how it's on very shaky ground because our nation is horribly, so many trillion dollars in debt. Borrowing from itself and borrowing from other nations, right? We know about this. And there's financially shaky times. If one world ruler could come in and offer you financial peace and prosperity, could offer you your pleasures and to give you a stable economy, all you have to do is sign up for the system. Take the mark. Do you not think people would want that kind of stability? Because that's what people in America are used to. That's what people in Europe are used to. That's what people in the whole world are becoming used to. Even in some of the third world nations, they're not third world anymore. They're becoming more advanced and industrialized. And people like that security of having jobs and cars and boats and campers and fun and recreation and activities. They like that. And if someone could come, a leader in the world that could offer the nations financial security and stability and prosperity, do you think people would sign up? What if that person said, hey, we're going to erase everybody's debt? Just sign up. We already know that's coming with health care, right? We know that when we put our credit card in the little machine and there's a little chip in it, there's a lot of things people know about us, right? If we knew everything they knew about it, we'd be shocked, right? Every time we use one of these devices, how it's hooked up to a World Wide Web, how many people know what our life is about, know everything about us? So, the spiritual rebellion will begin in preparation for this day with the emergence of an Antichrist. A godless man who opposes everything about God but we'll do it in a very seductive, suave kind of way that will dupe people in the world to saying, yes, we will follow you. Now, this falling away begins with some questions that I'm sure you have. Who is going to do the falling away? Who's going to do the rebelling? Who's going to be the, the ma major players in this rebellion? Do you think? Will true believers, true Christians fall away? And my answer to that question is no. If you're a true Christian, if you're a true follower of Jesus Christ, you will not deny Jesus. You will stick with it if you're truly saved. You'll stick with it. You'll follow. Apostasy will not sweep you over. Right? So I'm saying no. I believe Christians will continue their battle with sin. And if you truly belong to Jesus, your salvation in Jesus is secure. Every person needs to know that. If you are a follower of Jesus, your salvation, your faith in Jesus Christ is secure. Because a lot of people go to church every day and they're not really sure about heaven. I, you could ask them, are you going to be going to heaven? Well, I hope so. You know what? If you're here this morning, you need to say, no, I know so. 1 John chapter 5, I've written these things that you may know that you have eternal life. John says, we wrote these things down so you wouldn't question it, so you wouldn't be living in insecurity knowing that when you die or when Jesus comes that you're going to be with him. We want you to know that you're saved. That's the most important thing that every person... So that there's so many people on this street that you talk to. They're in religious systems all over this city. And you talk to them. Do you know that you're going to heaven for sure? Well, I hope so. I hope I've done enough good things. No. It doesn't matter what we do. It matters what Christ has done for us. That's all that matters. And our acceptance and our yielding to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So. Believers are not going to fall away. They're going, to be, they're going to be in him. But I believe the apostasy, the rebellion that Paul identifies here is more of an attitude. It's a climate. It's a prevailing spirit of demonic, influenced, deceptive, spiritual defiance. Okay? 
It's an apathy. It's a rebellion against what God's word teaches. That's what I believe it is. It's a spirit that says, we can't believe that. That's a bunch of old hogwash. Or as you hear people, well, you know, throughout the centuries, there were people who, you know, m- mess with the scriptures and the text. And what you have today is not really what was really originally, you know, all those kinds of arguments that are thrown up to water down the, the truth and the reality of what scripture teaches. That's part of this climate, this rebel spirit that's very much uh, a present in our world. Uh, and it's only going to get worse as the day of the Lord dawns. OK, this rebel spirit sadly exists. I, I have to say. This rebel spirit sadly exists in many churches today. You're going serious? Yeah, this rebel spirit exists in many churches today. Right? Many people who claim Christianity are part of this rebel spirit. I mean, it's a simmering hostility against truth that convicts. Truth that convicts, right? Truth gets convictional, we walk up, we get out. I don't know why those people left this morning. This is a pretty heavy message, isn't it? Not everybody likes heavy messages. I hope they're just going somewhere not resisting the truth. Maybe you're here and you want to get out. I'm not holding you here. I'm not offended if you want to leave. That's that's not my thing. God's just... Give me a passion to give you his word and what he says about what's coming so that we're ready for it. But I, I believe this, this rebel spirit is in the church. Pa- Paul said it in 2 T- Timothy when he said there were people would have a form of godliness but deny its power. They would be people who just want their ears tickled, right? They just want to be told, you know, good things. I go to church to walk away happy. And if that church isn't going to make me happy, I'm out of here. Right? It is the spirit that's present in this world that has watered down the grace of God into license. Right? It's the spirit of this world that says God gives us the ultimate freedom in grace to sin all we want. Right? God gives us freedom and grace to defy very clear teaching of the word of God and its authority that the word has over our life. If you look at Jude chapter three, I mean, Jude verses three and four, I'd like you to look at that. Jude three and four. You know, where's Jude? It's the book before Revelation. Little book, one chapter, Jude three and four. I don't have it on the screen. I'm sorry. Uh, Bring your phones with your Bibles. I I think it's important that you bring your Bible to church to look these things up because I just don't want you to take them at face value. You need to be diligent students of the word to make sure this guy has got it right with what scripture teaches right jude three and four this is this is this is towards the end of the the new testament period right and jude is the actual brother uh born he's a step half brother of jesus christ right because mary had other children right and jude was one of them okay you can look that up i found it necessary jude he says to write appealing to you to contend for the faith, right? He wanted to talk about something else, but things have changed in the world situation of Jews' day, and he says there's apostasy, there is false teaching, and so I have to change my message to appeal to you to contend for the faith. Stick with the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Why? For certain people, what? Certain people have crept in unnoticed into your churches. Notice, it says, who were long ago designated for this condemnation. Because they have a rebel spirit. They're apostates. They're, They're rebelling against God's authority. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality. In other words, they say grace says, go have as much sex as you want. It just doesn't matter. Grace covers it. God is gracious. He just keeps forgiving you even though your conscience and his word says it's wrong. Right? Just keep doing it. See, I know there's another verse in Scripture that people often miss, and it's Titus 2, 11 through 12, 
for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. Grace teaches us. Grace inspires. Grace instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. See, when you realize what grace costs, God's riches at Christ's expense, when you realize what grace costs, you're overwhelmed so that it inspires you in the power of Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit that it teaches you to say no to ungodliness and worldliness and it encourages you to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age as you look for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace is what teaches you and prepares you for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in to give, they pervert the grace of God and sensuality and deny, deny or only master the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the fact that we're under the lordship of Jesus Christ, right? Christians are under the lordship. He's our master. He's our shepherd. He's our savior. So in the days leading up to the day of the Lord, the apostasy will make its way into the church. The church community, the religious community. That's where apostasy is going to flourish. Apostasy doesn't relate to the world. The world is already believes what it believes. It, it defies God every day, right? Where the apostasy comes is in people who acknowledge God but deny His Word. Who acknowledge a form of godliness but don't have its power, right? And the challenge that Scripture gives to us today is, with apostasy coming, with a climate of apostasy that really exists in our society today, and apart from a major change that takes place, with a revival, Christians need to not get caught up in it. Don't get swept away with it. Don't let apostasy overtake you. Okay? Don't let it take you over. Be alert. Be ready. Now, I'm looking at my time. It's 1134, and I got a bunch of points. And I'm not going to keep going because if I try, I'm going to say it way too fast, and you're not going to catch it. So guess what? We're going to come back next week and look at these points. That's, this is our protection against apostasy. This is how those points on the outline in your bulletins are our protection against apostasy. I'm just going to close by saying... Look at the challenge that's before us. But here's how things kind of work its way out. I'm giving a little chronology of things in your outline. Notice the emergence of apostasy, the rapture of the church, the growth of apostasy under the, the influence of the Antichrist or prior to the Antichrist and the rise of the Antichrist. And then we see the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what's in the... So there's going to be apostasy. There's going to be the rise of the Antichrist. Prior to all this, there's going to be the rapture of the church. Rise of apostasy, even greater than what it is now. Growth of it. Rise of the Antichrist. The man of sin, man of lawlessness. And the second coming of Jesus Christ. So, big challenge. Don't get stuck. Don't get caught up. Be alert. Don't let apostasy overtake you. How do you do that? You have to stand firm in God's word. Accept no substitutes. Trust by faith that what God has given to you in his word is the truth. It's a truth that transforms every culture. If a God was big enough to create the world and make you and make me and make everything in it, right? He's big enough to communicate to us in every generation and give us a consistent message that never changes because he doesn't change. God doesn't change. His values don't change because people want to do things differently. We either abide by them, we submit to them, because the, the opposite of apostasy is surrender and submission. That's what the gospel calls us to. 
we realize that we're living our lives in rebellion against God. We realize that we are living for ourselves. We realize that we are desperately lost in our sin and guilt, and we cannot save ourselves, and we come to a Savior who is gracious and loving and kind and merciful, who poured out his life on the cross to cover every one of our sins. And he, in his power, makes us righteous through his blood, through his sacrifice, if we're willing to pour out our lives and trust in him. You notice the first point. I'll get into it more next week. Be sure you're saved. When someone comes to ask you, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? Are you a follower of Jesus? Do you know that you're going to heaven when you die? Don't say, I hope so. Say, I know so. I know my Redeemer lives. I know that he's conquered death. I know that he's died on the cross for my sins. I know him personally. I invited him into my life. I welcomed him to be uh, the, the, the ruler and Lord of my life many years ago or two weeks ago or today because I, I said, Jesus, I don't want to rebel against you. God, I don't want to rebel against you. I want to surrender and submit my life to you. I want to prepare for your coming. I see where this world is going, and it's, it's a world of great difficulty, but, but God has given us an opportunity in this world yet to reach people before the apostasy grabs people in. And we can be confident that God will use our testimony and our words to inspire others to believe in Jesus. So i just like us to bow in prayer. Father, I know before I really pray, I just want to say, I know to young people here in this day and age, um, kids here today, young, young adults, messages like this can be kind of, can kind of turn you off because it, they seem a little bit overwhelming and negative about life as we see it in our world. And, and, and my only thought to you today is, um, you know, um, when I was in high school, um, I heard these messages, and um, I always thought, man, that, ain't, that isn't fair, you know. Um, seems, seems like I'm never going to get married, never have kids, never, never be able to experience those things in life. And, you know, I, I don't know what God has planned for this world uh, in the sense of how soon all this is going to take place. But I can just tell you things have changed, and I think you can see that they've changed. And we don't want to be a part of the changes. We don't, want to, we don't want to give our endorsement to the changes. We want to stand true to Jesus Christ. We don't want to get caught up in this rebellion. We want to keep our hearts soft before God and say, you know, Lord, I just want to follow you. I, I just want to listen to you. I just want you to guide my life. Because I know that you guide me to good places. You guide me to eternity. You're there every day of my life to help me and encourage me and lift me up. You love me and you've put things in my, my path to, to protect me because you love me. And we just want to respond to God's grace and love to us in our life by giving our lives back as Romans 12 my brothers, in view of God's mercies, present your bodies to him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. That's really what God wants us to do every day. Here's my life, Lord. I give it to you as a living sacrifice. Father, I pray that that's our heart, that, that you would remove any rebellious attitudes in our life, soften us in humility to submit to your authority, to your to your word, to your spirit, to your son and his, his mastership over our life. And we pray that through our lives, maybe a revival would come to this nation. People's hearts would be turned back to you, the only God that we love. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.